Welcome to the Water Resources Podcast. Uh, I am Bridget Scanlon. In this podcast, we discuss water challenges with leading experts. And I'm really pleased today to welcome Paul Bowman. Uh, Paul is a senior engineer at BGC Canada, uh, but on the side then he does a lot of humanitarian work and that's going to be the topic of our podcast today. Mostly work in Sub-Saharan Africa where he applies his skills as a geophysicist and a hydrogeologist uh, to find groundwater in remote areas in many countries. So Paul, maybe you can give us a bit of background on how you got involved in this area uh, from your early studies. Sure, thanks Bridget, and it's, uh, it's great to be here for the, for the interview and the, and the podcast. I, I started my education as in Princeton in New Jersey. I have a geological engineering degree, which is focused on, on groundwater. And then um, after I got out of university, graduated in 81, give you an idea of my age. I, um, <clears throat> I, my, I guess my main motivation for, for a job as a earth scientist was something, a little bit of excitement get overseas. And the next five years I, I spent in Papua New Guinea and in Indonesian Borneo doing oil and gas exploration. And then um, I went back to grad school at, at the University of Waterloo. <clears throat> Where I was able to combine my interests in um, in geophysics and and groundwater, but I I think it was that experience of living in uh, Southeast Asia in remote locations, often um, working amongst um, you know very r- rural areas, very Im- impoverished areas, that kind of set the the pace for me to continually pursue rural water development in in less privileged parts of the world. So so since 1990, I've been running a a near-surface geophysics group of about 20 um, geophysics, geophysicists, with all of our focus being on the near surface, so water exploration, contaminant mapping, archaeology, tunnel detection. But but we've always um, we've always continued to do rural water supply work, um, sometimes paid, usually not, but all, all parts of the world. And and I guess since maybe 2014 in particular, much of that that focus has been in in Africa and, and in East Africa in particular. And, you know, it's interesting that this year the United Nations has a focus on groundwater and uh, the mantra is making the invisible visible. And I think uh, using geophysics, uh, which you have applied in many areas, it truly is an approach to making the invisible visible. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about your work in the refugee camps uh, early on from 2014 and Kakuma in, in Kenya and, and how that began. Sure, yeah. So um, so even through the 90s, I've, I've done a lot of uh, water supply in, in, I guess I'd say, remote parts of the world. For instance, I've done many projects in, in Yemen and, and Central America and and. It's in um, Aceh after the the tsunami during post tsunami reconstruction, but I'd never really been to a refugee camp until um, until 2014, where where I was asked to teach a, a course in in introduction to groundwater geophysics, water exploration, water quality in the Kakuma refugee camp in in northwestern Kenya. It's 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 I think then it was the third largest refugee camp in the world. Today I I, I believe it's the largest camp in the world at about 270,000 270,000 persons and um I wasn't there you know to to make the improve the water situation or uh to explore for water or or to, because the the camp as are all refugee camps essentially in the world it was run by UN UNHCR the United Nations High Commission of Refugees and I just assumed everything was under control and and people had what they needed and everything was fine I was there I was there to teach, and and the main goal, overall goal of teaching refugees in a camp was was actually to create livelihood. So, for instance, if they were returning, being repatriated to a third party country, they would have a potential livelihood to fall back on if they were being re- repatriated to their own company country. But even within the camp, um, people in these these camps live on on rations that are that are very meager often less than 1500 calories a day sometimes less than 1200 of those they calories of those food supplies they often sell many of them for phone cards for um fuel for cooking so often often even less so 
So one of the few jobs refugees can do in a camp is work in the water and sanitation sector. And by teaching this course, it allowed these refugees to work in that sector, get some extra money that could help support them and their, and their families. But anyways, while, while I was there, I, I certainly got a up-close look at the water situation in this particular camp, the, the Kakuma camp. And what I saw were very clearly, once once I, I got to experience camp life itself, was that first there wasn't nearly enough water, and the water quality was not good. So to put a little more detail to that, um, typically um, UNHCR and, and most organizations, they, they have a target of 20 liters per person per day in a camp. And if you think of the average North American, we use well over 300 liters per day. So 20 liters per person per day for cleaning, washing, cooking, drinking in the middle of the desert, in the heat of the day, without air conditioning, um, without um, dwellings that we would we would consider um, adequate is, is not sufficient. And the fact is, really, can they even meet these targets of 20 liters per day? During the time I was in the camp, the Typically, the targets, um, they were able to reach between 12 and 18 liters per day. And I've been to other camps where the, where the yield per person per day is about is as low as six liters per day. So, so barely, barely survival. And then in terms of quality, water quality, um, once, I start, once I was able to look at some of the actual um, water, water analyses at the camp, it was very clear to me that fluoride was a a, a ubiquitous problem in in this particular camp, not surprising because of where the camp is located in the east in the East Africa Rift Valley, and of course, of course, fluoride is is common and um, it's commonly associated with um, Rift Valley environments, alkali granites, fluoride bit, um, dissolving minerals, and and so forth. Um, and fluoride is a problem elsewhere in the world. It's not just in this camp. But what makes it unusual in a camp, of course, or not unusual, but particularly say, nefarious in a camp, is that you don't have a choice of other um, water sources. You're drinking water, and, and that's it. And the, and fluoride, is, the concentration, of course, is important. But what's more important is is the actual total consumption. In a hot environment, of course, you're, you're drinking more water, if you're not drinking water, perhaps the only other fluid you might be drinking is tea, which further concentrates on um, fluoride versus us. We have filtered water, we have Coca-Cola, we have orange juice. We, you know, we have a number of different sources of consumption every day. And here in Canada and most of the world, I, I think except for the United States, really, most of the world, um, fluoride um, guidelines are regulate fluoride to one and a half milligrams per liter. In the States, I believe it's four um but yeah and and above one and a half from one once you start to get above three you start to get in the uh, the realm of dental fluoris so, so once you approach six seven eight milligrams per liter you start to get into the realm of um skeletal fluorosis so in the in this particular camp from the 12 wells that were supplying the camp while i was there every well had had fluoride concentrations at above or way above the WHO Kenyan Canadian guideline of one and a half milligrams per liter. And, and dental fluorosis was obvious. You could just simply look at people's teeth and you could see um, brown, brown dis discoloration, for instance. Right. And, and so then you taught for a couple of years, 2014 and 15, and then you had an opportunity then to try to help uh, develop uh, groundwater resources, or you were working with some people on some of the existing wells, and then you thought you could contribute uh, to improve uh, the situation. So those 12 wells were mostly in the volcanics, and so they were getting fluoride from the volcanics. And so then maybe you can describe, you know, how you got started uh, using geophysical tools then to try to identify different types of geology that would avoid some of that fluoride. Issue. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so yeah, so I, I, I taught, I taught this short course in 2014 and again in 2015 in the camp and, and, and again, initially, I, I wasn't there to, um, I hadn't even considered doing a water exploration, water supply program. But through the course of being in the camp, and particularly there was one event, there was a, a massive flood that um, 
that damaged some of the wells, some of the water lines that impacted some of the some of the wells. And I happened to be a, a hydrogeologist in this camp, and and UNHCR called up from from Nairobi and asked if I could um, do some well sampling and some well monitoring. And, and it was through that that I I got a chance to see up close the situation with the with the flow rates that are recorded with every well with the with the water chemistry and i realized again not enough water and the water quality was not good and i thought well i can do better and and i knew what they had been doing because in the in the in the process of um teaching my course i'd reviewed with my the class every single water exploration um report that had ever been done in the in the history of the camp and i got to see what the main methods were which were two methods that I would I would never use. One is um in, in that type of environment. One is 1D resistivity, which is probably the most widely used geophysical technique in, in Africa, almost certainly the most widely used technique. And in some areas it does work quite well. But like any 1D geophysical technique, 1D assumes that the only changes in geology are in the vertical. That is all the geology is laterally um laterally continuous, like a layer cake, a birthday cake geology. And in some places in the world, in some places in Africa, that's that is true, but not in the Rift Valley. You have you have massive normal faulting. You have um great throws. You could have Precambrian igneous rock juxtaposed next to sedimentary rock, next to recent volcanic, sandstone, siltstone, shales. You have everything. And then on on top of that, the um, the the actual salinities can vary dramatically because you can have very fresh water, for instance, in that is recharged shallow sands and gravels, or you can have um, very brackish to even briny waters from evaporite deposits that were churned up in flash floods and then entered into aquifers. So the geology is enormously complex, not at all suitable for one D methods. And that's the good method they use. T typically, um, typically, and 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 this isn't speculation. This is straight out of many of the water reports. I I really want to, should say all the water reports I, I read. One D resistivity would often be used because it is required by um, Kenyan guidelines. But ultimately, wells would be cited using water divining, um, we, you know, water witching, which which you know can boil down to a little bit of black magic. But really, in practice. Um, boils down to the experience of the of the driller signing the well. So sometimes can be good, sometimes not so good. But nevertheless, I felt I could do better with um, you know, modern techniques and, and and a different approach. And secondly, I thought I could do better by targeting different aquifers. So of the 12 wells that were supplying the camp in, in 2000, in 2016, when we, we carried out our program, all of those wells without exception, we're drawing from from either entirely um, the volcanics or partially from the volcanics. And we know we know that fluoride has a at its source um, from the weather, weathered volcanics. Um, the flows of the well, some were pretty good, some were, were variable. But I was also hoping that it could improve on on quantity as as well. So in 2016, after being there in 2014, 2015, I, I I got a, a grant from geoscientists without without borders, and um, and 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 I, I, you know typically I wouldn't say what the value is, but I, but I'm going to say it now because in retrospect it was such a microscopic amount of money to to accomplish what we did. It was fifty thousand dollars, and um, and so for fifty thousand dollars in two thousand sixteen, five of my my colleagues and and a mountain of geophysical equipment, we came to the Kakuma ref refugee camp and we organized two two crews from the refugees that had been training in 2000, um, 2014 and, and 15. And we, we used some of that um, cash to, to pay them to the maximum amount that we could by allowable UNHCR stipend. And we mounted an exploration program. We used two methods, seismic refraction and 2D resistivity. And our, and our goal here was not to look for what everyone else had been looking for, these weathered volcanics. Our goal was to look for a, a different type of aquifer, um, shallow alluvial channels. We, we knew the camp, I mean, if you've been to the camp, you know the camp is constructed between two large, what they call lagers in Turkana, ephemeral 
riverbed. So Wadi and Arabic, Arroyo, if you're in the U.S. Southwest. And we know these lagas, um, they periodically um, flash, fl flash flood and they'll flow for, for several days. And when they flood, we also knew that they would recharge, well, we knew they recharged the volcanics because UNHCR did have some um, water level monitoring systems in their 12, in their 12 um, water wells. So we figured if, well, if, if, they were, if, the, if the volcanics get recharged and certainly deep, thick, superficial sands and gravels will also recharge if we could find them. So, so we designed an exploration program to hunt out um, deep sand and gravel paleo channels connected to these um, large lagers. And how, how, do we, how do we do that? Well, size refraction, of course, simply measures, gives you a, a cross section of the, of the geology of the subsurface. And pretty much wherever you are in the world, Overburdened materials, unconsolidated materials, a slow velocity, rock is fast. So, so that's easy. Mapping out the top of rock, and if we know the the top of rock that is a depth to the depth to the basement, then we can very quickly map out where the thickest sand and gravel channels are, and then, or at least the thickest overburden. We don't know where the sand and gravel, and then we use two D resistivity over these channels to determine if they're um, if they're very if they're conductive and if they're conductive they're either saline or clay or saline clays or if they're resistive which would mean they're sands and gravels and sa water saturated sands and gravel and so so that was the idea find the channels with seismic refraction and then determine whether those channels were saline and clay filled uh, fresh water and sand, sand and gravel field. So based on that program, um, which we did in January 2016, UNHCR followed with, with three wells. And those wells were three of the most productive wells ever drilled in the history of the camp. Each and every one, each of those wells were, were the only wells ever drilled in the history of the camp that had fluoride concentrations um, below Kenyan WHO guidelines. I think they were 1.1, 0.9, and 0.6 milligrams per liter. And they were all TDS. And I'm I'm extraordinary pleased, maybe relieved is a is a more accurate um, statement. I'm extra extraordinary relieved that I, I was back in Kakuma um in March of the March of this year. So that's um 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22, 23, seven years later, and all those wells are not only are they still producing, but those are the main wells that are supplying the Calo Bay expansion camp and more than half of the Kakuma camps. So, so yeah, very, very successful. And it's, you know, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but, it, but to some degree, I, I, I guess I get a bit of hyperbole. I could say in, in a couple of weeks, and that's all our program was a couple of weeks. We, we did more to developing, expanding the understanding of groundwater and water supply and, in 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 that camp that had been done for years and years and and certainly a big part of that was simply well bringing a, a fresh look at things but also using modern geophysical techniques not state of the art i mean these are now standard techniques seismic refraction um and 2d resistivity these should be used all the time not on, not just exceptional circumstances yeah, I think that's amazing, uh, Paul, uh, what you guys accomplished on such a shoestring budget. Uh, but you also have a big equipment uh, um, business in, with a lot of geophysical equipment. But the logistics of taking that over there and, and making that happen, I just cannot imagine. But I think what I admire also greatly about your work is that you involve the local people. You had trained them uh, in schools, you know, with the, the short courses that you provided in 14 and 15, and then uh, they were able to use those skills and apply them in the field. That's fantastic capacity development, you know. And so then they can go forward then and, and continue to do that. So as I, if I recall correctly, you were able to map two paleo channels and were they anywhere located next to what the current channels are, where the current channels are, or uh, were the paleo channels in the subsurface uh, located away from those current channels? Yeah, the, um, so in the, in the Kakuma camp, that, that's right. We were able to, we mapped paleo channels connected 
to the largest lager, Lager Tarash. And, um, and, and, and in retrospect, and, and especially in reference to the current drought, I, I, I think that was quite fortuitous in that, um, you know, as, a, as, a, as I said up front, the, you, need, you need an aquifer, of course, but, you know, a shallow aquifer is, is only as good as um, uh, how much water you pump at it and how sustainable is that is how much water is, is recharged. And we knew these aquifers are, are recharged, and we knew in particular that um, aquifers tied to Lager Tarash were recharged frequently because it's such a large lager in, in Kenya. Um, in the Turkana area, you get two rainy seasons, the, what they call the short rains in the fall and the long rains in the spring. And there's usually a week or two of, of rain. They're not like monsoons. But what's happened, not like monsoons you might have in other, other parts of Africa or India, let's say, but what's happened in, the, un, in an unprecedented fashion since 2019, these rains haven't come. There have been five successive um, failed, failed rainy seasons. And this whole idea of um, recharge can start to, to fall to pieces, especially in such shallow aquifers. But fortunately, because we these particular channels were tied to Laga Tarash. Laga Tarash is unusual in that its watershed actually reaches into Uganda, which has re received rains, and, and Laga Tarash, in fact, has um, has has flooded a few times over over the past few years, and, and in fact is is flooding right now. So so that was that did work out, and and um and it, and it's worth noting because um you could say to some degree we. We we lucked out, and um, but but I guess uh, more broadly speaking, of course, every the solution that works in one area isn't going to work everywhere. And and mapping PLO channels in in Turkana West and the area of Kakuma might not be a successful approach in in other parts, for instance, of of Turkana. And and so, sure, the geology is important, but but every any area you work, whether it's Turkana or anywhere in the world, of course, the probably the first thing you, one should always do is is step back and look at the the broader geological context. And and in this case, targeting these pinnacle channels was a good approach because the entire um, camp it's almost like an island set between two large um, two large lagas, Laga Tarash and La and Laga um, Nabek. So. So, um, but you know, another part of the world, another part to kind of an, another approach might would might might be the way to go. And and were you there when all the the wells were drilled? How many wells were drilled uh, in total uh, at that um, camp? And was, was was that funded by UNHCR uh, or you know? I know you had some minor funding to to get going, but then did all did the communities drill the remaining wells, or were you involved in all of those initial wells? Yeah, in, in Turkana, in Kakuma, we were there in, in January, and then UNHCR, in cooperation with um, University of New Chatel, they provide some geological expertise. They, in I believe in April and May, they, they drilled what, what became known as, as boreholes 13, 14, and, and 15. And since then, other wells have, have been drilled. I think they're at well 19. At, at this point, and, and I think some of the a few of those were drilled by WFP World Food Program and FAO Food and Agricultural Organization, which are which are subsets of 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 the UN. And again, it's um you know the this was part of my my education going to one of these camps. Um, you know we hear about refugee refugee camps all over the world, but the reality is for the for the most part, with very few exceptions, um. All of these camps are, are under the UN, UN auspices, UN, essentially UNHCR, United Nations High Commission of, of Refugees. Some are, have shared um, control with, say, UNICEF or IOM, International Organization of Migration, which are also um, UN organizations. But essentially, the UN is responsible for these refugees. So they're responsible for food, education, security. Um, protection and 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 water, of course, water and sanitation. 
Right. And um, so that was a huge success. And then you mentioned previously that uh, some of these refugees come to Canada and the US and and uh, you were able to look at some of the health impacts of the high fluoride uh, with studies in Canada. Uh, and you did uh, cover some papers on that. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah. I'm uh, <laughs> brag a little bit. I'm probably one of the few geophysicists that, that has a, uh, a paper co-authored in, in the Lancet. And after um, after one of our programs, I, I think it was after after, my, after actually it was after my teaching stint in 2015, I, I came back to Calgary, and doctor at the Calgary Refugee Clinic, uh, Dr. Annalee Coakley, asked me to to meet someone. So I went to a coffee shop downtown, and there was a um, a, a, a refugee who had come to Calgary. His name was Muhammad, and um, and he was introduced to me as a, a a man that was 45 years old, and he had the skeletal structure of a of a 90 year old person. He could barely stand up on his own. He was on crutches. He was in a great deal of pain, um, very stiff. And they they had suspected the refugee clinic had suspected that he had fluorosis, but um, but they did what is the typical test, the urine test, and his fluoride level they were, they were typical of of anybody that lives in a in a in a city that that is fluoridated that is drinking fluoridated water but that was already a bit of a tip off cuz at that point Calgary had had the city council had voted to stop fluoridating so that that didn't quite make sense but nevertheless his his fluoride levels from his urine were much less than someone that was suffering from fluorosis um, my, as I recall, the clinic had contacted the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and and they had responded that, in fact, they had looked at fluorosis in, in many refugees, many of the Kakuma refugees um, that had come to the States. And anyone who's seen the 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 movie, What is the What, um, the Hollywood movie, would know a little bit about that, that, that they had tested them for fluorosis and, and none of them had it. And, and probably they tested them for, for fluorosis, not because so much they came from Kakuma, but they were coming from East Africa, um, Somalia, South Sudan, um, Ethiopia, Eritrea, areas that that are known to have in the Rift Island, are known to have high fluoride. But anyways, when I when I met this refugee, Muhammad, I I um kind of kind of skipped the small talk, and I I asked him two two questions right away. What part of the camp did you live in? And he'd lived in the camp for six years, and um. And how and how long it had been in the camp, which was which was six years, and he had lived in in a section of Kakuma too. The camps divided into one, two, three, four, and then into zones and blocks. And I knew from immediately from the reticulation maps from the water systems that he had been in been drinking from well five and only well five, which is the well that had and has for many years had the highest fluoride concentrations. Um, sometimes approaching 10 milligrams per liter. So in my mind, there was no doubt that he had had fluorosis, not having, and nevertheless, not having any medical background. But but the um, Calgary Alberta Health and the Refugee Clinic, they 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 essentially be believed me, and they went on to do a battery of tests. They literally spent a million dollars on on the, on this one patient, doing all kinds of. Um, tracer tests and bone biopsies and 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 um and and mr surveys and 3d imaging of a skeleton and so forth and in particular what was diagnostic was the was the bone biopsy that showed beyond any doubt that he was suffering from um, severe skeletal fluorosis so you know of course this is um it's good for him because he, he has the diagnosis and, and then can move on for there. But it's good for all refugees because it, it, it identifies that it is something to be looked at. It is something to be to be targeted. Um, it identifies that the, the practices until that um, until that time were inadequate for screening for fluorosis. And and I, and I can tell you what I, what I have heard from um, doctors that previous to this this di this diagnostic diagnosis of, of fluorosis that very often refugees would come complaining of skeletal pains, complaining of back pains. And they do the urine test, they don't have fluorosis, and their concerns would be dismissed. Oh, you're a refugee, you're suffering from 
post-traumatic stress, you're suffering from PTSD from that civil war in South Sudan or that famine in Somalia or, or political violence in Burundi. And they would say, no, my back hurts. And and they would not be believed. And and so this is, you know, this has given um, doctors, you know, essentially all across the world, um, certainly in North America, a better tools to diagnose fluorosis and better understanding of the prevalence of fluorosis in um well, certainly in the refugee community from Kakuma, but I'd say more broadly, refugees from right. East Africa. And, uh, you know, so you worked in Kakuma early on. And when you went back recently, I got the impression that you were working with the communities around the refugee camp, because sometimes I've heard from NGOs that the communities around these refugee camps have worse situations in terms of water and food than actually the refugee camps. So did you do work for the Takana community uh, when you visited recently or uh, were you trying to develop water resources for the pastoralists or the groups there? Yeah, that, 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 that's absolutely a, it's a, a definite perception from the, from on the Takana perspective. It's definitely a reality in, in many aspects that people in the, the refugee camps have a, I don't want to say a, a, a better life, but to some degree an easier life than than what they call in humanitarian speak the the host community, and and in this case the host community are the are the Turkana people, which I'm sure for most people they have no idea who the Turkana. Uh, you can kind of think of as these sort of uh, colorful Maasai like um, tribes people, but living a a a, a nomadic, a semi a pastoralist life in a, in the desert environment. Versus the the savanna. So these are the people that have lived for millennia in northern Kenya in, the, in these desert environments, um, herding goats, donkeys, um, cattle, and and camel um, through the Turkana, and and then often ranging very far into Uganda, into South Sudan, into Ethiopia, basically following the rains, following the grass, and. Um, and the last again, the last few years has been particularly hard. It's been hard on the refugees. It's you know they're they're living on a limited amount of water, um, a very limited food rations, um, and then all the problems of just being a refugee in a in a foreign country. But it's just as difficult for the Turkana. They 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 aren't having water trucked into them. They don't have. Um, education they don't they don't have similar education services provided to them that UN is obligated to provide in the camp they don't have the medical services that the UN provides in the in the camp and and so forth and they benefit very little from the camp being on on essentially their their tribal land so as, as, partly as compensation to this um you know many of the NGOs do try to provide some services to the to the um, to kind of so for instance in the training course that I was putting on about thirty to forty percent of the students were to kind of people and and in fact they were able to benefit benefit dramatically from this because some of the Turkana were from the um, working with the Ludwa Water and Sanitation Company Lawasco and um and it was great what they they were able to get a lot of very practical knowledge that they were then be able to, were able to apply for their for their jobs but for the more traditional Host communities, um, you know, that are lot largely illiterate, that are pastoralists, that are their lives revolve around taking their flocks from one watering source to another. They they aren't benefiting from the camp, and they're suffering um, beyond words from from this drought. I mean, the the things you see, people walking ten kilometers or more with a filthy twenty liter jerry can digging down into a hole and taking what they would call water what we would call mud and and then taking it back to their to their home it's um it, it's heartbreaking so this most recent program that was um that was sponsored by similar similar sponsor and support as, as the previous programs i did with the small israeli ngo called israel aid as well as um umcor the united methodist council of relief this particular program was targeting um, targeting water sources for the host community, for the Turkana hamlets, say within 15, 15 or 20 kilometers of, um, 
of um, of of the refugee camp. And and were you successful? Was it a similar situation? Were you able to identify paleo channels, or was it the regolith on top of the volcanics? Or yeah, that that's a that's a great a great question. And I, I was almost hoping you wouldn't, wouldn't ask it, but um, of course that's the the obvious question. That the answer, the truthful answer is we 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 don't know. I mean, we were we were targeting we were targeting anything that might be a good aquifer. So yes, we were targeting paleo channels. We were targeting faults, and we did have some great success mapping some spectacular faults near another um, Turkana Hamlet in 2016. It hasn't been drilled yet, but we think we have a, a, a great target there. Um, you know, the sandstone units, there's, um, there's fractured rock, rock units. There's a variety of different units that we were, were targeting. We, we, we've just completed the reporting um, by Kenyon Law, um, uh, dr a drilling tender can't go out until there's been a, a report. So we finished the work in early March. We just completed the report. The report's going out now. We've cited two wells. Um, um, we're hoping they'll be positive, but but we really don't know. And um, I say to some degree, I'm, um, you know, usually I have a pretty good idea. Um, um, you know, pretty much wherever we go in the world, but but we're really suffering from a significant degree of uncertainty here, largely for two reasons. The geology is just simply so complex. As as I said, you have a uh, every lithology you can imagine from from you could be standing and beneath you, beneath a floodplain, there could be Precambrian granites, there could be Cretaceous sandstones, there could be recent volcanics, and then you have all kinds of faulting. And then, and then you could, and then even when you do find water, it could be anything from brine to, to meteoric water. That's one problem. And then, then the other problem, which is, which, um, of course, we only we can blame nature on the first problem, but we only have ourselves to blame on the on the second problem. Is this is just really no background information of of any value. There's no decent geological maps. There's no, um, there's no water well database um you know i i was out in some areas with one of the turkana experts from the um water authority who supposedly knows more about about um the geology of the area than anyone and we were standing in a uh a plain a basin between um two two small mountain ranges and i i asked and i showed him our ge geophysical sections and the and we knew we were on top of rock because we had very fast seismic velocities, and but we had no idea whether we were on volcanics or sandstone or crystalline basement. And I, I asked him to speculate, give me your wildest guess, and he he couldn't. There's just no information, and and I say that's our, our fault because there should be information. Um, many dry holes have, have been drilled, uh, many, many, and many NGOs have worked there. Government has worked there. Um, church organizations, um, you know, freelancers from all over the world have come to save the world and and bring a rig and and stuck holes in the in the ground here and there, and yet, and yet you can't get any information. When I say any, not not I never saw a single lithology log, and so you know, people, it's difficult to um, without any types of ground truth. Truthing, it's difficult to make confident interpretations and you know certainly and, and, and it's often difficult even just to repeat not to repeat mistakes that, that have already been done so you know again we use 2d resistivity and size refraction good good techniques for pretty much surefire finding of of paleo channels but some of these hamlets were far away from any of the large lagers so so we're looking for bedrock um, aquifers um, seismic is a great technique for finding faults and, and resistivity it can be pretty good if you have significant offsets. So we have that. Um, you know, resistivity is great for ru ruling out some some targets. So, for instance, if the resistivity is a really low, it could be saline. You don't want to dr drill that. Could be shale. You don't want to drill that. But but you know, you hit this sweet spot of resistivities of you know fifty to one hundred ohm meters. It could be it could be a um, an amazing sandstone aquifer, or it could be a, a terribly weathered volcanic 
aquifer that with all the fractures plugged up with clays and and you really just don't know to until you drill drill a hole. So again, we have a couple of targets, and they'll be drilling those in the next month or so. And um, and we're hoping they'll obviously we're we're hoping they'll be successful. And and if they're not successful, we're we're certainly hoping the the information, as embarrassed as I will be, we're hoping the information we know the information will go public. We're hoping it will be included in the government database that is being constructed now. Um, yeah. And if it's success, and, yeah. Go yeah. ahead. And I wonder, you know, I mean, you mentioned there are a lot of NGOs and all sorts of groups out there drilling and doing all of this stuff, but some of them don't have geologists to help with that sort of thing. And then there are a lot of, uh, you know, when they drill dry holes, I mean, that's a, that's great information also, you know, but we never publicize our mistakes, you know, or, or they call them test holes or something. So, and then they don't report them or, or things like that. So we would really benefit from more information. And it seems like some groups, they use colonial era maps, you know, that were developed in the 40s and 50s, you know, and have to rely on that. It seemed like there was a lot more geology done back then than there is now. But you have all these boreholes and you have them PVC cased. So you could just do downhole geophysics in many of these and get a lot more, uh, get a lot of information if there was uh, an opportunity to do that. Yeah, that, yeah you said a, a few things there, um, Bridget, that, that, that are very, very important. Um, and, and you're right. Um, um, different organizations will come and they'll want, they'll, they'll get budgets to drill very expensive test holes, but but a, a dry hole is, is certainly as good or, or better than a test hole. Um, you know, a, any geophysical program, of course, what do we do in geophysics? We try to identify some physical property that will distinguish an aquifer, the aquifer, what we're looking for from everything else, the host rock, the host material, fresh water, from salt water, sandstones, from, from weathered volcanics, and, and so forth. And all over Africa, um, it's it's astounding. All over Africa, most water wells are PVC cased, so you can run, you can run induction logs for electrical conductivity, electrical resistivity. You can run natural gamma logs to identify lithologies to distinguish clays from from shields, and you can run magnetic susceptibility logs to get a sense of how useful um, magnetic exploration would be. And that's something um, I. I, I, you know, being a geophysicist, I, I like see like looking at physical properties. It's like other people would. It's like another sense. It's like you have sight and sound and and taste. Geophysicists, we have resistivity and magnetic susceptibility and radioactivity. These are these are our our senses, and um, and it's how I I try to begin. I like to begin any exploration program. Um. We did a, a massive water exploration program in Malawi in 1999, 2000, 2001. And, and the first thing we did was we we pulled a lot of the pumps out. And we pulled, we, we identified about 20 wells that weren't functioning. And they had a long history of production. Um, they had a long history of production, but the well, the, the pumps themselves weren't functioning. So we pulled the pumps out. And while the pumps were out on the ground and being fixed, we did borehole gamma, resistivity, magnetic susceptibility logging. And we were able to identify what were the physical properties that make a good aquifer, what are the physical properties that produce a dry hole. And that's how we designed that program. And, and that's what I've, I've tried to do since. We just did something very similar immediately preceding this Kakuma program in, in um. In North, Northwest Kenya, we did a three-week water exploration program in, in northern Uganda. And there we did exactly that. We, we divided it into two crews. One crew repaired wells, and they pulled, they pulled the pumps out. They repaired the pumps. And while those pumps were out of the hole, we do surface geophysics, 2D resistivity, do borehole geophysics, um, resist, resistivity and magnetic susceptibility. We do... Hydraulic, um, hydraulic testing. We do isotope sampling. We do water chemistry sampling. We run a borehole camera. Um, you know, something almost everyone forgets is that you know when you have a, a hole in the a borehole, all you really know is you have a borehole there. You don't know where it's screened. You don't know what the depth is. You don't even know if that driller really did put a, 
a screen there. So so we always um, run a borehole camera as well and really try to pull as much science out of the well as we can. And then we use that information to inform our, our exploration program. And um, you know, I can tell you in the, I don't know, 40 or so holes we've drilled in Uganda, we, we have not had a, a dry hole. And, um, and we think part, you know, a big part of that is, is a huge part of that is, is, is doing all the, all the science that we do on these repair holes. And most, most NGOs, they would, they would just laugh at this. They would say, this is a aid project. This is a humanitarian project. You know, it's not a, it's not a research project, but in fact, that, that science is is really what uh, allows the the real confident exploration to to go forward and and you know and and the, and the great thing too is after we've done all this science at these repair holes we put the well back in the we put the pump back in the hole and the, and that village has a, a a working well usually usually installed better than the the previous well so it's a it's a win 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 situation well i think that that's an incredible i mean I, I did a little bit of geophysics way back early in my career when I was working on radioactive waste disposal in West Texas and, and Jeff Payne was uh, trying to teach me some geophysics. But I mean, if you're walking along and you're trying to figure out where we were trying to find places where there was no water movement for radioactive waste disposal, but having an, an electromagnetic instrument that you could walk along with you was like a set of eyes. You know, and then you could do downhole borehole stuff to try to figure out what was controlling what you were seeing, you know. So I, I think it's it's amazing. And I think with the United Nations program this year making the invisible visible, maybe we can promote more and more geophysics. And uh, then if NGOs and other groups get more comfortable with it, you know, they can realize the value of it. Because, I mean, you read a lot of reports, maybe one in six uh, wells are successful or, you know, five or out of six might be dry holes. And, and so really we have to improve that success rate. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely, Richard. And, and, you know, certainly, I can tell you, I've been to, what I call, I, I guess what they call um, cluster meetings. I, I've been to many of these in, in, in crisis situations, for instance, in Bangladesh after the Rohingya um, ethnic cleansing and in, and in Aceh after the um, 2004 tsunami and so forth. And, the, and these cluster meetings, all the NGOs and, and UN workers and international aid agencies, they all gather from their various sectors. So for instance, a, a wash cluster, water and sanitation and hygiene, um, you'll have, you know, whatever, 50, 60 people working in that sex sector in, in a room. And and yeah, it's a fundamental problem in the humanitarian sector. I mean, not only do people working in WASH need to learn about geophysics, but but very often, and, and really the truth is most of the time, they, they simply do not have a, a strong professional background in hydrogeology in, in general, uh, most of the time they come from a logistics background or a public health background. Very rarely you'll actually have a hydrogeologist making hydrogeological decisions, and 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 almost never will you have a. Pretty much never will you have a geophysicist in the room saying, "You know, you should do some borehole geophysics. Uh, or you should, you know, you're in you're in Bangladesh. You're, you know that." You're you're on the Technaf Peninsula. Um, you're drilling. There's there's ocean here within 500 meters of the ocean on on each side. You should do some surveys to map the saltwater intrusion front. And no one's even asking those questions. So yeah, there's a the whole level of the um, humanitarian sector needs a major um, facelift in terms of its. Um, of even asking and then addressing the the important professional questions to to deal with the subsurface. Ha, ha, having said that, uh, as, as a, I think you you and, and I know something that's caught the interest of 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 people all over the world. A lot of our work is um we're working. I mean, I'm working less and less with NGOs, less and less with um professional humanitarians. Let's say, and and more and more with the people in the villages, with the people that are depending on the wells, that are actually um, drilling the wells, that are trying to make their livelihoods, supplying their own um, livelihoods and, the, and, and, and their own villages. And 
And certainly what I've found over the last many years to working in places like Kakuma, but especially in, in small villages is, yeah, maybe you need a degree in geophysics to understand everything about ev everything, but but you don't need a de degree in geophysics to do geophysical surveys, N no more th than you need to be a master mechanic to to drive a car. And so, <laughs> so we've been putting a lot of energy into um, into people in, in these areas where we've been working in Zambia, in northern Uganda, um, and even in, in, in Kenya somewhat to train them on how to do their own surveys, how to interpret their surveys, um, and then how to actually follow up on their data, not just have some plots and data and, and, and wait for some NGO to magically appear from the sky and and put a, a water well in, but to drill their own wells, to install their own pumps, to maintain their own, own pumps. And and everything I've seen is it can be done. And, and in general, it can be done a lot better than the humanitarian sector has shown that, that, that they can do it. And absolutely no question, they can do it a lot cheaper. Uh, we, we just finished our second well in Uganda. And I say we, I'm sitting here in my basement and, and the Ugandan villages we've been working with, they finished the well. And the, the, the cost of that well was $2,100 um, for um, drilling, casing, hand pump, civil works uh, around the well. So, um, so yeah, I think, so, I think that, yeah. that, that's amazing. And, uh, you know, your description of them drilling, hand drilling the wells, it may take them a week or two or whatever to drill some of these wells. But it seemed like they're using technology that they're comfortable with. And, and then it seemed like they would feel like they could drill the next well and the next well. And they wouldn't be relying on outside uh, groups then. And so they become more self-sufficient. So the drilling and also I think uh, I was impressed with your attention to detail with the, the um, cement apron and to prevent any contamination of the wellhead and, and uh, keep water away from it. All of those details are so important. And, and then the capacity development, uh, the training of the local people, then it seemed like they're more likely to keep maintain these wells and keep them functioning. Uh, so I think all of those aspects feed into a resilient water system for these groups. Yeah, that, that that's right, Bridget. I mean, again, a lot of NGOs would, would laugh at us, like we're going to drill. So in this last program, in, in just three weeks, in less than three weeks in the field in, in Uganda, we repaired wells in 11 villages, restoring water supplies to about 6,000 people, um, did all this science, and then we cited uh, we cited 11 wells, and those wells are, are being drill, drilled now. And it takes about two weeks um, to to drill a well. When I say drill a well, that's drill the well, install the casing, install the pump, and then build a, a fence around the area, plant a garden, do the civil works. And, and again, a lot of NGOs would laugh at us. They would say, look, we could, we could do all that in a month with a, a mechanical rig. But, but to some degree, I'd say that they're, they're missing the point. First of all, the, there's no sacrifice in, in quality. Um, these, these wells were, were putting in. Um, it's the same hand pumps they would, they would use for a mechanical rig. We have an annulist that we, we sieve a gravel pack. We, we put a bentonite plug. Um, we do water sampling. We still do water chemistry. Um, it takes longer. And there's advantages to take longer. We get better cuttings. I, I think we more properly site site the screens. Um, we use we use a crew of about 18, 16 to 18 to drill these wells. We're using we're using in these wells, we're using what's called the Baptist method, where where you, you basically you show up at the site, you cut three three trees down, or one one long tree, you make a tripod, you rig a block, you have the the drill you have the drill stem. And uh, a bit with a foot valve, and then a percussion bit. Usually, we start with a one and a half to three inch bit, and then you can pound your way down to weathered crystalline rocks. You can get down 20, 25 meters in in a few days, a couple of days, and then you ream out to four inches. You ream out to six inches, and and you end up with the same thing as a mechanical rig. But you've used the village, you've employed the village, um, the village. You know, you need water for mud. The village hauls water um, because you don't have water. That's why you're, you're there drilling the, 
the the wells. So they're hauling water from a stream or, or a spring. So they're very they they're providing the the muscle power of lifting that stem, dropping it, lifting it, dropping it thousands of times a day. Um, so they're very involved. They're very engaged with it. Um, they they see every detailed step of the of the well construction. They're working with our Ugandan trainees. To, they get to know them. Our Ugandan trainees are living in the village during that time. They're being fed. They're they're being housed. And when and if there's a problem down the road with the well, the villagers they'll better understand what the problem is. They'll know what the problem is. They'll better take care of the well. They'll better maintain the well. And they'll, without any question, they'll um, have this ownership of, of the well that, that simply is, is not there when an NGO or, or some other or church organization, some humanitarian organization, um, you know, comes in with their mechanical rig, rips the hold down in a few hours, uh, a few engineers from the big city from Kampala or Gulu build the, the silver works and they, they walk the way, they walk away. There's, there's no ownership, there's no understanding of maintenance and um and that's certainly one of the main reasons why wherever you go, not just in Uganda, wherever you go in Africa, you see, you know, I I would estimate one out of three wells is simply not not functioning. And um and there's no there's no re reason for that. They they should be functioning. People in the villages should be able to maintain their own their own water systems. Right, and I think that was uh, similar to the results from the British Geological Survey studies. You know, said so that uh, you know about a third of the wells are not functioning. And I think the approach that you use then uh, with the techniques that uh, the people are comfortable with, the communities are comfortable with, and then in the process, then they, they learn about the geology and, and the functioning of the well and everything. So I think it's time well spent. And then to have a large group and then then have the other people that they can call on later if they have issues. Um, so I really appreciate uh, your uh, taking the time today. I'm a huge fan of your work, Paul. Our guest today is Paul Bowman from Calgary, uh, who has been doing humanitarian work in many regions globally. Uh, but what we've discussed today was mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. He provides the uh, geophysical equipment and then he does the work pro bono and he organizes all of this. I just uh, cannot imagine. I just feel maybe you just don't sleep, Paul. That's all I can surmise but uh, I, I really appreciate what you do and and I hope uh, that uh, we will get other groups to incorporate your techniques more and uh, um, have expand this program yeah thanks so much Bridget it's um it's, it's so much fun talking about um these programs and partly because they you know they're, they're so interesting and they're so important but I can tell you also because they're, they're just so much fun I mean it's great working in Africa, it's fantastic working in these these villages. It's it's so fantastic working, you know, creating your kind of own mini organization where where you're working directly with the with the people and eating their food and speaking their language and 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 seeing how they live and and really seeing firsthand the the benefits of um you know of all this education and and efforts it's it's very it's very satisfying and uh, it's a good time i recommend it to anybody well thank you so much uh, and we'll talk to you later bye thank you bridget bye bye